Okay, now we're going to move on to induction. And induction is one of those areas that I always have a bit of a, of a problem uh, trying to explain, not because it's like, you know, I don't get it, or it's the, the tough part about teaching sometimes is to explain things in a way that other people understand. And so induction tends to be one of those problems where students either kind of naturally get it or don't or struggle with it. And so as we go through this, I'll try to explain it in a way that the notation you'll notice is different from the way Rosen does it in his textbook. Um, I try to do it in a way that hopefully is a little bit more helpful to you. All right, uh, what we're going to work on is proving a universally quantified statement. And we've done this before, uh, only in a select small group of possibilities of this. But we're going to try to prove it where you have a well-ordered universe of discourse, but one that in particular is infinite. Now we've had problems before about proving uh, over a universe of discourse, but trying to show something that you know for all, you know for all elements that you're talking about, they evaluate to be true on a particular proposition. If it's a finite number of cases, you know, this is a proof by exhaustion. So you would do things like, hey, for everything that I have, uh, if I want to show P of N, and my finite cases are my first element, my second element, all the way up to, say, my kth element, and there's, there's a finite number of them. And then we would say, logically, this is just the same thing as saying, hey, uh, show that it's true for the first case and show that it's true for the second case and show that it's true for the last case. And I can do it since it's finite. We could march right through this and do them one at a time. The problem is infinite cases has this issue of the for all n p of n is logically going to be you're going to have to show it's true for the first case and show it's true for the second case and then well we never stop. So I can't prove by going through each of these cases one at a time because there's an infinite number for me to do. Uh, the easiest example would be what was on the previous exam would be uh, if I'm asking you to show, you know, I could take the contrapositive statement that if n is equal to 2, 3, or 4, then uh, n squared has to be greater than or equal to 2 to the n. And so you would go through this and say, all right, that's easy enough. You would have the first case would be n equal to 2, and then we would have our second case, which would be n equal to 3, then we would have our third case, which would be n equal to 4, and then for each of these you would just assume and then show that, hey, 2 squared is greater than or equal to 2 to the 2, or 3 squared is greater than or equal to 2 to the 3, and then 4 squared is greater than or equal to 2 to the 4th, and these are all true. And so I've shown it. I just had three cases to handle. We could handle it. On the other hand, we have a different problem. If I would say if n is equal to, say, 5, 6, 7, dot, 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 and I want to show all the opposites true now, n squared is always less than 2 to the n. The exponential grows faster than the parabola. Um, I can't do the cases. All right, to be able to do this, we can't do cases. Because there's an infinite number of them. And if there's an infinite number of cases, you know, that's where on the test, if some people went and said, oh, let's try five, and let's try six, and let's try seven. And you would go through it and say, oh, look, five and six is true, so therefore it's true. It's like, no, you have to do all the cases. And so, how do I handle a problem like this? This is still a for all n p of n, and I would like to show that this particular thing is true. Um, how to do it? And that's where induction comes into play. Now, it does not handle you know, all of these. Induction itself, it's a proof technique. And there's two types of inductions, but it's really one. But induction itself is a proof technique uh, for showing that for all n, p of n is true. 
for, but in particular, we're only considering these n, right? n are not from, and so we're, we're looking, it's an infinite set, but a particular type of infinite set. I'm, I'm going to re restrict it to a specific type of infinite set that is well ordered. Now, discrete two is going to be necessary to define what well ordered means. Um, but the idea behind well order itself, if you just want to do a loose definition, would be that that for every to have a well ordered infinite set, well ordered just simply means that every subset of your set has a least element. And one way we can look at that is we could we could talk about it has some sort of start element. And then what happens is for this thing to be well ordered is it has a start element and it looks something like the, the set itself, a well-ordered set. has some sort of element one, which is less than or equal to element two, which is less than or equal to element three, which is less than or equal to, etc. In other words, there's order, it's a linear chain, and so that's called a total order, but in particular, it's well-ordered, so that would mean that no matter what subset I take, there's always gonna be some sort of, so if I could go through here and take you know, all the even occurrences. And so if we go through it like the twos and the fours and the sixes, there's always a first, right? There's, there's somebody who's my start. So that's the easiest way to just loosely define what well order means. As, as we go through this, there's a beginning. No matter what, you have a first element for it. And so what happens for well ordered sets that if I would like to show a for all n p of n, and it's too hard to do, right? I just can't show this because I can't go through it and march through all the infinite number of cases. What we do is we prove around it, right? It's just the same thing as if we would have other proofs, like I want to prove an implication. We could try contraposition. We could try contradiction rather than just a direct proof. And these proofs, induction itself, is based upon um, two tautologies. The first tautology that you have would be the, the following long statement. And this is tautologies, and these are based upon well-ordered sets. And I'm going to pause this. Hopefully that didn't cause any issues. It's always bad about when you're a tech job. People can't print. <laughs> so instead of just teaching, i got to work on that. All right, anyways. So there's two tautologies uh, that occur. Uh, the first tautology, the thing that's always true, would be the following rather large implication where if you can sh show, and again, these are from a universe of discourse that's made up of element one, which is less than element two, which is less than or equal to element three, etc. It's infinite, but it's well ordered. So you show it's true for the first element and you're able to show that if it happened to be true for the kth element, then it would be also true for the k plus first element. Implication for all n p of n. Now, this entire thing is a tautology. This is always true. And so this is an implication, and the thing to remember about implications are if you have left, right, and you want left implies the right, the left is either true or it's false. The right is either true or it's false. Implication would be true, false, true, true. So if I tell you that you have an implication in it, and it's actually a tautology, that means that this entire line here isn't there, right? So the only possibilities that you have if an implication is a tautology, is that it must be true implies true, or it has to be false implies something. 
Now when I look at this, I notice that if the left-hand side, which for us, the left-hand side would be this bracket right here. If the left-hand side is false, I know nothing about the right-hand side, which is that part right there. It's either true or false, I don't know. On the other hand, when I look at this, I definitely know that if the left-hand side is true, the right-hand side is true. And this is what we'll actually use to prove what we want. What we want is we want this to be true. So it ends up being that this tautology allows me to say, oh, you want this and that's too hard for you to show? Well, because this is a tautology on a well-ordered set, if you want this to be true, it's the same as simply showing rather that that's true. So if I can show the left is true, then the right has to follow as well. And that just occurs because of this tautology. And you know, it's this idea like if you want to, you could consider this, you know, somewhat, you know, in a way, I suppose, a, a form of memorization. But really, with this entire thing being a tautology, it would end up being that if you want to show for all n p of n to be true. It's the same as rather show that this left hand side, which is a conjunction, and because it's a conjunction, that means I have to show these two things. I have to show case one that it's true for the first case the first element of your set, and then case two, that if it happened to be true for the kth point, then that would form it being true for the k plus first element. In other words, uh, needing to show this statement, which is too hard for you to do, breaks down into a two-step process. Because this is a tautology, it ends up being that, you know what, all you need to do is show that this is true and show that this is true, and then this will follow along for free. So each of these cases, instead of normally being called cases, they get their own special name. And case one, being shown true for the first element, is normally called the basis step. And case two, where I have, if it's true for the k, if it's true for the k plus first, this is called the inductive step. In particular, this particular tautology, uh, the inductive step itself, is what's called weak induction. And so a better term for this, uh, if you're reading like textbooks, would be to say this would be called weak inductive step. And the next tautology, which will be the strong inductive tautology, yeah, they're both induction and they'll look very similar. So to prove a for all n, it's enough to show for the first case. We need to show it's true for the first element and then it's a case. What this looks like is essentially the concept behind this is dominoes. And so you could sit there and say, hey, you know what, let's line up my first element, let's line up my second element, let's line up my third element, and let's keep on going until we line up the kth element. And right beside him will be the next element, which is k plus 1, and they keep on going. And so we can imagine this being dominoes. And so the basis, which is I need to show that the first element is true, is this idea of I can take my first element and I can go ahead and knock him over. So that's what this says. It's Whatever you're talking about, your propositional function, the thing that you're discussing, you can push it over, the very first one. The inductive step, or the weak inductive step, is to show p e k implies p e k plus 1. And so what that it means is, this is an implication, so we could prove directly or indirectly, but the idea here is you would assume this, you would show this. So what do I assume is, I assume that EK has been knocked over, and then what do I need to prove is that EK will push over the next. 
So if this is like dominoes, you would sit there and say, you know what? I don't care if you're on the first, the second, the third, or the fourth, or fifth. It doesn't matter. I do know that if you're ever at one of these elements and it did fall, it would push over the next element. These two together obviously knock over all the dom dominoes because this guy just simply marches along. I knock over the first, but then this says, well, if you do knock over the first, the second has to fall. Then it's like, well, if the second falls, this tells me that it pushes over the third. If the third falls, it pushes over the fourth, they all fall down. And therefore I've shown for all n, p of n. And so this inductive step is this, is, it really all, is an algorithm of just simply pushing over all of these things. If I have an infinite number of them, it's enough to push over the first and be able to show that any element will knock over his neighbor, and that's weak induction. So, what's the difference between weak induction tautology and strong induction tautology? The strong induction tautology, so my second tautology would be that, again, we still have to be able to knock over my first element, and we still have for all k, but what happens here is we have not just simply p of e sub k implies p of e sub k plus 1, right? We look at this and say, you know what, what would happen if the one before wasn't enough, it wasn't strong enough to knock over the next? And so imagine dominoes that get progressively taller like this. Now, E1 could knock over E2, but if E1 wasn't here, E2 would not be strong enough to knock over E3, and so if that's E2 and that's E3, E2 is not strong enough to push over E3, and so the falling would stop. But on the other hand, the only way for E2 to have fallen would be if E1 was actually leaning on it, right? And that what I now know is that, you know what? E1 plus E2 is enough to knock over E3. But if E3's fallen, what happens? Well, I've got E2 leaning on it, I've got E1 leaning on this one, and these three together are enough to knock over E4. In other words, we don't just simply, if you're at the kth, it ends up being that, you know what, I actually need, to get to the kth means that the first has to have been done, and the second has to have been done, and everything up to the kth has been done. In other words, these are all leaning on each other. And so we're taking advantage of the fact that as they start to fall, they all lean. And so the weight of this one, this one, and this one, and this one, as they start to fall, it's enough to knock over the next. And that's what this implication says, that, hey, if you're up to the case, that means all of these working together are enough to knock over this one. And then, again, that'll prove for all n, p of n. And so what changes about, and this one is strong induction, And really, if we think about it, strong induction is weak induction. You just simply say that, well, I didn't really need these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all leaning on EK. Doesn't matter, all right? EK is enough to have done it. And so weak induction says, well, if that's enough, why do I have to even write the other ones? But sometimes there's problems where you do need these here to work together to knock over the other one. And so um, the only thing that changes here is the basis is still the same. So the basis step is still, we still have to show that your first element in your set does indeed fall over, that this is true. But your inductive step has now become, I need to show that all of them essentially, everything from E1 up to the kth element have been true, knocks over the next one. In other words, this is the strong part, that I need certain ones of these or all of these to push over the next element. And so this is the strong inductive step. And again, we have a two-part problem. For all n, p of n is too difficult to show. So it's enough to do the basis, which is showing is true for the first element. And then from then on, they can work together to knock over the others. And so that is induction. Uh, we are going to turn, so 
any of these problems where you're asked to prove for all n p of n where n is from some sort of elements e1, e2, e3, etc ends up being the proof, an inductive proof has two things. One, we have to prove the basis step which is show it's true for the first element and the next thing we have to do is prove the inductive step which is an implication which is either the week where you have, I only needed the one right before, that the kth knocks over the k plus first, or strong says I need more of them, that means I'm going to need from one to the kth, since they're leaning on each other, is going to show the k plus, k plus first. So we've turned one proof into two cases. We have to do the first proof, which is actually just it's a, a step in, throw in this first element, show that it's actually true. And the second one is a implication. So you're going to use a direct proof, an indirect proof, however you want to do an implication to be able to do it. All right, so next I'll start doing some examples.